Okay, so chapter 12 has all been about statistics, how we do statistics, mean, median, and mode, standard deviation, how we find different values, how things are dispersed in our um, data sets and all of that stuff. And now we're going to talk about normal distribution. Normal distribution is kind of a big one. Um, and we will see as we work through it that anytime you've ever approached a teacher or professor and said, hey, do you grade on a curve? This is normal distribution. That's actually what you're asking about, is do you grade on a normal curve? And you will see in some of your homework problems that that's not actually what you want it to be. Um, the normal curve means that you know if the top half, if the class is going to be assigned A's and B's, that cutoff may be at 86, and if you scored an 85, you're given the letter grade of a C. That's what it means to be graded on a curve. And we're gonna see that in some of your homework um, in this section. So just be careful that you actually understand what you ask before you ask a professor if they do that. Uh, no, I don't grade on a curve. You get what you get. So before we talk about uh, the normal distribution and try to understand what in the world that means, we are gonna differentiate between two different kinds of variables. Uh, one of them is known as discrete random variable, and one of them is known as your continuous random variable. Discrete means that you can only take on a certain fixed value. So there's a limited number of things that can happen in a discrete random variable. It's either this or this is kind of what it is. And so the example is tossing a coin. We toss a coin, there's only two options. You're gonna get heads or tails. That's really all there is. Maybe in some miracle, it might land on the side, you know, if you feel really good and somehow landed on the rim. So there would be three total options. That's it. Um, but when we talk about continuous random variable, it could take on a whole range of values. If we talk about the diameter of a camellia blossom, or if we talk about the average weight of a baby born in a given week, or the amount of rainfall in a given month, that can take on a really wide range. It's not just one, two, three, and so that's con uh, considered a continuous random variable. I made a note on this handout that most of our distributions that we've talked about in this chapter have been empirical, meaning based on observation, and most of the distributions covered in this specific section of 12.5 are going to be theoretical, which means they're based not on what we observe, but on what theoretically could happen or should happen. And so just know that as we get into these. So here's a couple of just examples, not a problem we have to work out. I just wanted to kind of show you what these are going to look like. Um, chapter 12 follows chapter 11. Uh, that's how numbers work. But we haven't done chapter 11 yet. Chapter 11 is actually the very last chapter we cover, and it's about probability. And so sometimes you're going to see things like probability density that's going to pop up in 12.5, but you yourself are not actually finding the probability of anything, per se. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be able to read the table. And here's what it's saying is this is the which it didn't, it cut off a little bit. This table shows the number of heads when flipping five fair coins. And then it shows you the probability of that actually happening. So this is all of our coins. Like we get zero heads, what's the probability of that happening? We get one head, what's the probability of that happening? Two, three, so on and so forth. So if you were asked what is the probability of getting one head if you flipped five coins, you would look at this table and you'd look over here. And probability is always given in percentages, but oftentimes your table is going to have those percentages represented as decimals. So you have to pay attention to what your problem asks. If it wants the percentage, it'll put the percentage next to your answer box. Mm -hmm. And so if this was asking me how many, um, what's the likelihood that I'm going to have one head out of these five twin tosses, uh, tosses it's actually 15.625%. Because you move your decimal to the right two spots to go from a decimal to a percentage. So there's a 15, basically a 16% chance that I'm going to have a, a, I'm going to have one head pop up. And so most of your probability questions are going to be, can you read a table? 
and that's what it is. What I do like about these two graphs over here is it does show the difference between the discrete random variable and the continuous random variable. Discrete random variables, as the definition above says, only has a couple different options. So with our coin tosses, you can have zero heads up to five heads because we're tossing five coins. So that's a discrete. So the table can look like this. It can be a bar graph. But when you have a continuous random variable, you're going to have a bell graph like this because you're not just having one, two, three, and four options. You have a whole range. And remember this, based on the example above, is the diameter of our camellia blossoms, and they go from 5 to 25 centimeters, and there's this whole range that falls under here. And so this is what we're going to be playing with more today, are these bell curves. Bell curves show the probability density, a.k.a. the probability per unit is along the horizontal axis. What we're really dealing with today is the normal distribution or normal curves. Normal curves are symmetric, bell-shaped curves. They look a lot like this. You're going to draw a lot of these in your homework and through this section. Any random variable whose graph has this characteristic shape is said to have a normal distribution. And so we're going to look at all the different things that we know about normal distributions just based on the fact that it looks like this. And then we're going to actually compute some information. So the first two pages really are just kind of notes and reference. So this next one, there's some graphs. I like the colored graphs better because I think it's easier to differentiate what's going on here. So I do apologize that we have no color printer. They are scanned in color, though, I believe. So what you're going to be dealing with most are graphs that look like uh, the S here. So that's the red one. That's the standard. That means you have a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. It's going to go like that. The A, as you can see, the A is way off center to the left. It has a mean that's less than zero and a standard deviation of one. B, you still have a standard deviation of 1. So S and B, those are going to be really similar. Uh, but the standard deviation for B has, is less than 1. So it's a little bit scrunched. That's why it's taller. And then the normal curve C has a mean that's over here. So it's greater than 0 with a standard deviation greater than 1. The majority of R's are going to look like S's and B's. They're going to be centered around some mean there in the middle, and then we're going to have our deviations going off. So that's a nice picture, but really the big piece of information is in the next box, is this table. Here we see a standard normal curve. The graph of a normal curve is bell-shaped and it's symmetric about the vertical line through its center. And here's something that's interesting about normal curves. The mean, median, and mode on a normal curve are all the exact same value. And that's nice. We don't have to compute any of that. That will be given to you in the problems. And they occur right here in that middle line. So the middle line that cuts our bell curve in half is our mean, median, and mode. So that's nice to know. And then there's this empirical rule. And some of your problems on Pearson will tell you to use your empirical rule to answer the question. The empirical rule states that the percentage of data values uh, within a given distance from the mean in both directions are approximately as follows. If we go one standard deviation, we go one deviation out from our mean, we're going to have 68% of all of our data values. We actually saw that in a previous section. We proved it. If we go out two standard deviations, we're going to have 95% of all of our data in that realm. If we go out three standard deviations, we've got 99.7% of all data in that section. So because of that, standard deviations in a normal curve typically do not go out further than three. If you look at, which I know we haven't really gotten to this table yet, but if you look at the table, it only goes to 3.35. We kind of stop because if you notice, look what happens. 
at 3.3, everything says 50. And that's because we're looking at the area under the curve over here, and that's half of our curve. That's 50% of our curve. And so once we get after 3, basically, it starts becoming to where it's hard to differentiate such fine, small amounts because we've already included everything. So we will use this information, the 68, the 95, and the 99.7 to help us calculate some information. And I'll bring that back up. So that's just for reference. It's good. It's helpful. On my note card, I would probably make notes of this so that I could use it because I'm going to have to use it to answer some questions, like the next one. Here's finally a question where we're going to deal with some stuff, some standard deviation, some normal distribution. It says, suppose that 300 pre-med students take a midterm exam and the distribution of their scores can be treated as normal. If it tells you that in your graph, you're going to use the normal. And since we're in 12.5, which is all about normal distribution, they're all going to deal with it. Find the number of scores falling into each of the following intervals. It says A is within one standard deviation of the mean. If we are a normal curve or normal bell graph like this, 68% of all of my data falls within one standard deviation. You can't see my finger, but you can see the 68 on there. So if I need to find how many students fell within one standard deviation, I'm going to find 68% of that 300 students that took the test. Which is 204 students. Now, this problem doesn't tell us what that standard deviation is. It doesn't tell us what the mean is. It doesn't tell us what that middle is. But we can know that 204 students are going to fall within one standard deviation of that mean. Based on our empirical rule, what percentage of students are going to fall within two standard deviations? 95% are going to fall within two standard deviations. So we need to figure out what 95% of 300 is. And it's 285 students. So some problems are just that easy. When we get to use the empirical rule, usually our lives are kept pretty simple. The algebra is pretty minimal. Now, that's really nice when they fall within a standard deviation or two standard deviations or even three standard deviations. But a lot of ours are not going to fall so nicely. They're going to be, you know, we're within 0.125 deviations and things like that. And then we're going to have to try and figure that out. And so we have a nice table which I'm going to reference and I already have a little bit. But this little graph right here kind of gives us a general understanding of what happens. It says the column under A gives the fraction of the area under the entire curve that lies between Z equals zero, which is our median, that's our middle point, and our Z point over here. Now we talked about Z scores previously. Do you remember Z scores from last time? And we found it, we took like the data value minus the mean, and we divided that by our standard deviation. We're going to use these scores again today. And actually, if you look at this table, which this table can be found in your textbook on page 715, but I went ahead and made copies, and it's also here in this handout. Um, this table is the area under the standard normal curve. And notice we have Z columns. And we have A columns, Z column, A column, Z column, A column. So the Z column is our Z scores. And then what we're going to have is at a certain Z score, we have this A. This A is the area that's under the curve. That's the shaded part right here. That's the percentage of data that falls within that range. And here's the deal. 
from our z we have or from our zero our median here our mean we have positive z's on the right hand side these are values that are greater than our mean and on the left hand side we have negative z's these are ones that are less than our mean now on our table though like if i was trying to find the z score of z equals negative 1.25 and so I'm trying to figure out how much area is underneath this curve. If I look at my table, what do you notice about all my z's? If I'm looking for negative 1.25, all of our z's are positive. But here's the nice thing. If we're dealing with normal distribution, it's symmetric. So if I'm looking for a z-score of negative 1.25, it's the same as if it was a positive 1.25. So I can look here and say, okay, the area under the curve is 0 0.394. This would be 0 0.394. The negative tells me I moved to the left of my mean. If it's a positive z-score, it means I moved to the right. That's really all the plus and minus of our z-scores tell us. You can still use the table, just look at the positive. So that means the area under this curve is 39.4% of all of my data. And that's how we're going to use this table. We're going to do some examples. It'll make more sense as we do them. And then remember, I do have it, my scanned-in work for the homework and my scanned-in work for the practice test, and I try to show all of my steps there as well. So this one says use table 16. That's the table we have our z-scores in our area. To find the percent of all scores that lie between the mean and the following value. It says one standard deviation of the mean. So when we think about this, we have our standard deviation over here. And we have our mean in the middle. And it said we had 68% within one standard deviation. But that's when we include the standard deviation on the left and on the right side of our graph. So when we're looking at A, one standard deviation is telling us that we need to look at z equals 1. Because these z's are telling us how far out we're going to go. And you're going to see something that's kind of, kind of nice with this. So look at your chart and somebody tell me what is the area under the curve when z is 1? 0. 0.341. And so if I had to give this as a percentage, I would move my decimal to the right two spots. That's 34.1%. Notice if we doubled that, we have 68.2. And it's because 68% is going to fall within that one standard deviation, but that includes this side and this side. Our problem asks just between here and here. So basically, we cut that 68 and a half is what we did. We cut it in half. because this one specified that we're doing above the mean. This next one is 2.45 deviations below the mean. So that really tells you that the z-score here for b is a negative 2.45. But like I mentioned, if you look at your table, you will never find a negative value in your z's. And that's just because it's symmetric. So there's really no point in having negative values for your z when you can look at the positive and get the same information. So look up the value, look up the A for Z equals negative 2.45. 0 0.493, so that means 49.3%.
Make sure that when you're answering these questions, you pay attention to how many decimal places they want you to do. I know I did one problem and I sat there and stared at it and, and stared at it and stared at it because I'm like, I know I have the right value, but it wanted me to go out to the thousandths place, which is three decimal places out, and I only went to the hundredths place. And so when I finally just did my third submit, you know, and it told me I was wrong and I saw that I needed to go out three decimal places, that was super annoying. But, yes? So this is going to tell us, because later you're going to have to draw some pictures. Okay. And so what we have with our image here is if we're going one standard deviation above, then we're going over here and we're only looking at this space. Okay. In our empirical, we look at both sides. And so it's just important to note if we're above it or below it, because here in a minute, what we're going to do is we're going to have a deviation that's above and a deviation that's below, and we have to find the total area under both. You'll see. Okay, for these problems, they really didn't matter, to be quite honest. It's just something to make sure you pay attention to as you progress, because they will get a little bit harder, and we will take into account multiple Zs. And we have some pictures on some examples coming up. Other questions before we do some more problems? Really start using our tables. All right. So as the time links of a phone calls placed through a certain company are distributed normally. So it's going to look like our, I think they look kind of like ghosts, to be quite honest, or little bells. But here we go. There's our little bell. It says they're distributed normally with a mean of six minutes. So this is six minutes right here in the middle. And it has a standard deviation of two minutes. So if we mark our first deviation out here, and it's two minutes more than six, that means it happens at eight. If we're two minutes less than six, that means our phone call was four minutes. If we're two standard deviations out, then that falls at 10 minutes or two minutes. I think these problems really help make a little bit more sense of what my world standard deviation is, to be quite honest. If one call is randomly selected from this phone company's records, what is the probability that it will have lasted more than 10 minutes? Okay, so we've already made our graph. We've got standard deviation of two minutes each. So if we want to know the phone call is likely to be more than 10 minutes, it's going to be this tiny little tail of a section out here. You think that looks like 35% of that graph? 5%? We'll see. So notice that this happens after the two deviations. On our graph, or on our table, what is the percentage at two deviations? If, how much? Well, that's for both sides. That's why we have to use this, not our empirical. So I'm going to look here and try and find two. Uh, where's my finger? There it is. When z is two, the area under there is 47.7, or zero. So here's what this says. I wish I could do it. I'll do some colors. All of this in blue is 47.7%. Because it's everything under the curve all the way out until two deviations, which is 10 minutes. But this whole half of our graph is 50%. Because if we cut it in half, this is 50% of our data, this is 50% of our data. So if we want to find what this itty bitty little tail is over here, which represents 
the amount uh, or the probability that our phone call is more than 10 minutes, we're going to take 50% and we're going to subtract out all this blue stuff, which is 0 0.477, giving us what? 2.3. So there's a 2.3% chance that some randomly picked phone call from this phone company lasts longer than 10 minutes. Since it's symmetric, we could also conclude that there's a 2.3% chance that the phone call lasted two, less than two minutes because it's the same on this side. If it was looking at the average length of my phone calls, they would all be under two minutes. I hate being on the phone. Ugh. I think drawing the pictures helps to identify what it is we're actually looking for. And so for most of my problems, I draw them. They may look like a slug. They may not look great. But it helps me to see what it is I'm actually looking for and highlighting what it is that I actually know. So when the z-score is 2 and it tells me the area is 47.7, that's all the area from my mean or from my middle until I hit that z-score of 2. So it's all of this space. But this problem asked me for phone calls longer than 10 minutes, which is all this extra little space out here. That's why I took 50% minus the 47.7%. Does that make sense? I will tell you these problems take practice. They take practice in learning to, excuse me, to identify what it is that they're actually asking for um, and where things may overlap. Because sometimes we'll have to subtract like we did in this case Sometimes we're going to have to add. Bless you. All right. This one gives us pictures. We're doing two different problems here, but they give us pictures. It says, find the total area that is shaded in each of the following figures. Now, it doesn't shade super well in yours, but it's all of this space here. So notice that on this one, we are dealing with space to the left of our mean and to the right of our mean. So we're going to have to find some different pieces of data. The first bit, which I kind of shouldn't have colored it all in, but is here. This left side, I need to figure out what is the area under that curve. Well, from the mean to that z, it's negative 1.45. So I'm going to look at my table, and I'm going to look for 1.45. 1 1.45. 0 0.426. So that's for this left side. Then I'm going to have to look over here on the right side. The right side, my z value, is 2.71. 2.71. Right down here. 0 0.497. So if I'm trying to find the total area under the curve, that's going to include the left half and the right half. So I'm going to have to add these together to get the total area under the curve, which in this case is 0 0.923, or 92.3, depending on which format they want it in. This one I had to add. Questions, clarifications on how I did that? Okay. For the next one, we're finding the area under the curve here. <clears throat> what do you notice about that space that's different from maybe the other ones we've done? It doesn't start at the mean. It doesn't start at the mean. That's exactly right. 
that's okay. We can still find the area under this curve using the two pieces of information that they do tell us, which is our two different z-scores. It tells us the z-score on this side and the z-score on this side. So the one thing that's really important to note is that when I use the information given to me, see, mine don't look very good. This over here, when it's 1.59, that's my far right z-score. That's going to give me the area under the whole thing here, all the way up to the mean. Now, obviously, that causes a problem because I don't want this space. That's why they give me this other z-score. Because this other z-score, let's see if I can mimic. Oh, my gosh, what was that? My guys, I don't know. I don't know what that first line was. Just ignore it. But here at 0 0.62, that's all this spot. So the area under the curve here is the area up till the z is 0 0.62. So what I'm going to have to do to find the green colored in space is I'm going to have to take the a at z equals 1.59, and then I'm going to have to subtract from that the area at z equals 0 0.62 because I do not want this blue area included. I need to cut it out. So in this one, I'm subtracting. So let's figure out what is the area when Z is 1.59. Who wants to find that? Okay, lots of fours. Four, four, four. All right, and what is the area when z is 0 0.62? 2, 3, 2. So if we subtract those, we're going to get 0 0.212, or 21.2%, depending on which format they want. So the images are important. And if they don't give you images, making images so that you know, is there a gap? And this is where it's important. You asked earlier why it's important if it says above or below the mean. This 0.62 is above the mean. If they would have said 0.62 below the mean, that line would have been drawn over here, and I would have just been doing a problem just like this one. And so this is where it's important, because if they don't label it positive and negative and they say above and below, that's how you're going to know where to draw your lines in your bell graphs. So we're finding the mean? We are not finding the mean. They will give you the mean if they need you to have it. Okay. And a lot of these we don't have to have it because they do give us our z-scores. Okay. And the z-score is all we need. If they don't give you the z-score, a lot of times they will give you the mean then, and you have to find the z-score. Z-score was from 12.4. And we're going to talk about and do some problems here where we actually have to find the z-scores in order to do these problems. So these problems, they gave you everything you needed. You just had to look it up on the table. Questions, clarifications? They're weird. They're different. but I promise once it clicks, it clicks. Mostly it's referencing this table, and we will see here in a minute where we're going to have to do some z-score calculation on the next couple of problems. All right, let's look at the rest of this. We'll do some more problems. Because doing problems is about the best way to learn this material. All right, so here's what these following different things are asking for. The meaning of normal curve areas. In the standard normal curve, which is what we're dealing with in 12.5, there's three different qu quantities that are equivalent. And so the wording of your problem may differ depending on how they're wording it here. It could ask for the percentage of the total number of items that lie within an interval. They could ask for that. It could ask for the probability that a randomly chosen item lies within that interval. That's what our phone one did. It said, you know, what's the probability that the phone call lasts more than 10 minutes? It could ask you for the area under the normal curve. 
That's what this last one asked us for. But all of these, regardless of if it asks you for the percentage, the probability, or the area, it's all asking for the exact three. It's the same thing. Same thing. The way we approach the problem will not be different. And so just know that as you work through these. We don't have to worry about it. From 12.4, don't forget that your z-score is the item minus the mean divided by your standard deviation. We will use this information because a lot of times they're going to give you certain values and you're going to have to compute where a cutoff point is. Like for that grading on a curve situation. You're going to do a problem where you're going to figure out what is the cutoff for the Bs. And you have to figure that out. And you'll see a lot of times it actually hurts the students to be graded on a curve. It doesn't help them. And then also making sure that you have your table. Because we're going to use this formula. This z equals x minus x bar equals over s. And we're going to use this table to find the percentage slash probability slash area. So on my note card, I would for sure put that. Not on the table, though, because you can't write on your table. All right. Let's do a problem that we actually use all of this information, and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. It says, in one area, the distribution of monthly miles driven by motorists has a mean of 1,200 miles and a standard deviation of 150 miles. So on all of these problems, in my homework, on the practice test, if it started like this, I always made notes. I would put the mean and I'd put the standard deviation over to the side just so I know where it is I'm starting. So somewhere I would write the mean is 1,200 miles and we have a standard deviation of 150 miles. Then I don't have to go back to the words to find that information. Assume that the number of miles is closely approximated by the normal curve, a.k.a. we can make one of those bell graphs for this curve. Find the percent of all motorists driving in the following distances. This first one says we are going to find the percentage of motorists that drive between 1,200 and 1,600 miles per month. So you are more than welcome to make graphs if you so choose. It tells us here in the middle, that's where our mean goes. In this case, our mean is 1,200 miles. So for A, we're traveling between 1,200 miles and 1,600 miles. So we need to come out here to 1,600 miles. Now, every time we go out of standard deviation, we're going 150 miles. So at standard deviation 1, we're at 1,350 if we go out another standard deviation to deviation 2, we're at how many? 1,500. Because 1,350 plus 150. And if we went out three deviations, we'd be at 1,650. But we don't need to go all the way out to three deviations. We just need to go out to 1,600 miles. So we're going to fall somewhere in here. So this is where I didn't do a graph actually for this one because it's not totally helpful, at least in my terms, because it's not a nice Z number. It's not deviation 1, it's not deviation 2, it's not deviation 3, it's 1600. But we know our how to figure out Z scores. Z equals X minus X bar over our standard deviation. They gave us X bar. They gave us S. And this one is going between our X bar and our X. 1,600 miles is where we want to get to. That's our data value. So let's figure out what the Z is. Sixteen hundred minus twelve hundred divided by the standard deviation of one fifty. What's four hundred divided by one fifty? To two decimal places, please. Is it two point six or two point six six? 
If I want two decimal places, it's going to be 2.67. So the bar over the 6 means that it repeats the 6 over and over and over and over and over again for forever. And so it's just a bunch of 6s. But since we're going to round to two decimal places, because our table only goes to two decimal places, we have to round up to 0.67. So now we just calculated the Z. That means the Z here at 1600, our Z value would be the 2.67. So if I want to find the percent of the motorists that drive between 1,200 and 1,600 miles, I need the area under the curve at 2.67. So then I'm going to go to my table, and I'm going to look for 2.67, which is 94.6%. No, I said that. Thank you. 489.6%. I don't know why I said 94 Yeah, at least I didn't write it. I was saying it wrong, writing it right. So the majority of motorists really drive between that number. Do we see how we did this? Okay, B is between 1,000 and 1,500 miles per month. So notice the difference here. With the first one, we were going from the mean to some other value. That's the nicest way it can work. Here, though, we're not going from the mean. The mean lies in between here. So having an image might actually be helpful just so that we can see what it is we need to compute. So here's our mean. Our mean happens at 1,200. But we want to know we have 1,000 to 1,500. We need to find all of this space that lies between 1,000 and 1,500. So notice we have to find stuff over here, and we have to find stuff over here. So what we're going to have to do to find the area under the curve or the percentage of drivers that go between 1,000 and 1,200 is we need to find the Z at 1,000 so that we know what Z value we're dealing with. And over here on the right, we're going to have to find the Z value at 1,500. And then after that, we're going to be able to look at the areas under those curves and add them together, and it's going to be nice. So we have to find two different Z values on this one. Let's start with Z at 1,000. And I'm going to put the little 1,000 down here so that we kind of know. So when Z is 1,000, that 1,000 is our X. So we have 1,000 minus the 1,200. Whoa, not that. All over the 150. That's negative 200 over 150. And we're going to take it out to two decimal places again, negative 1.33. That's the Z value at 1,000 miles. So if I wanted to know what is the percentage of drivers that drive between 1,000 and 1,200, I go to my table for 1.33. 1.33 is 0.48. Zero point forty with an eight, not forty eight otherwise. Now I do the exact same thing for my right hand side. For Z is fifteen hundred. That'll be fifteen hundred minus the twelve hundred over the one fifty. Three hundred over one fifty is what? Two. Yeah, that's a nice one. So that's a deviation of 2, where we look at our Z table and we go to 2 to figure out the percentage. And it's 47.7. So this right part of my graph is 47.7. The left part of my graph is 48. I hate how that's 
say 40.8 is really what it's going to be. So if I want the total area that's under both sides, that's going from z-score of negative 1.33 to positive z-score of 2, then I'm going to be adding these amounts together. I'm going to be taking 0 0.408 plus 0 0.477 to get a grand total of 88.5. They're weird. Better? I was like, I think the problems with words make it a little bit easier than just random, like where you don't have a lot of information. <clears throat> the algebra itself in these problems are not particularly hard. The hard step comes from understanding what it is they're asking for. So draw the weird flat uh, slugs. The flattened hats, they will help. All right, let's do another one. It says a particular normal distribution has a mean of 81.7 and a standard deviation of 5.21. All right, so I've got some information. We've got a mean 81.81.7. Standard deviation of 5.21. What data value from the distribution would correspond to z equals negative 1.35? So this one's different because in this one we have our z value. We don't know what our x value is. Because notice we've got all these different pieces that work for our z value. Because our z value is x minus x bar all over s. Well, we've got x bar, we've got s, and we've got z, but we don't know what value that actually correlates to. So we're going to plug everything in that we do know, and we're just going to solve for the piece that we don't. When it asks you for the data value, you're going to be finding the x. So I know my z value is negative 1.35. My x is the unknown. My x bar is 81.7. And my standard deviation is 5.21. On the right-hand side, I need to get x by itself. I'm going to multiply that 5.21 over. So I have zero, or excuse me, negative 7.0335 equals x minus 81.7. Add the 81.7 to both sides. x is 74.7. Your problems where you're finding the cutoffs for your different, like for B's, when you grade on a curve, this is the process that you're going to be working through. So this one we didn't have to use our table at all or anything like that, which is nice. This one's really just algebra. Can you move stuff around? All right. <clears throat> Next one, we're going to find the Z score. So they are going to give you, <clears throat> excuse me, the area, and you have to figure out where does that happen. <clears throat> excuse me. Now, you would like to think that this is just as easy as looking at our table and calling it good. Some problems are. But these are worded slightly differently. It says for A, we need to find the total, it says 30% of the total area is to the right of our Z score. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture because I like to draw these little flattened hats. All right. So there's our mean, which they don't give us because it's not really that important for this. But what is important is I need to get to the z value. I need to figure out what this is. And it tells me 
that 30% of all the area is to the right of the Z value. So remember, when we go from the mean over, what percentage is this total side over here? 50. Yeah, because we cut the total area in half. This falls right in the middle. So this whole space over here is 50%. And if we know that to the right of my Z value is 30%, what do we know about this space in here? It's got to be 20%. So what I really need to find is I need to look at my table and figure out what Z value correlates to 20%. Because remember, Z values tell you the area under the curve from your mean to that value. That's here. So what Z value correlates to 20%? Which one? Point fifty three. Yeah, that's pretty close. It's not quite there, is it? So when we look at our table, this is a problem you will encounter. Obviously, we're encountering it right now. If we look, we have 0.198. That's 19.8%. And then our next one goes to 20.2%. We kind of jump that nice 20%. So when that happens, you take the average of these two. Okay, So when you don't have the perfect percentage that you're looking for, you take the average of the two that are closest to it, one on either side of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 0 0.52 plus 0 0.53, divide that by 2 to get 0 0.525. That's my z-score. Look at B. B says 80% of the total area is to the left of my Z. So really, it's, I mean, it's the same picture. Because where we stick that Z over here is what we're trying to figure out. But this time, it says 80% of all the total area is to the left. So that's all of this. And all of this is 80%. Everything that's shaded is 80%. But what do we know about all of this to the left of my mean? Yeah, it's 50%. So if that's 50%, what's the space to the right of my mean until I hit my Z? 30%. So I need to look at my table and figure out where does 30% happen on my Z's. Because this is just the space right here, just the area from my mean to my Z. That's exactly what's given in my table. So let's figure out where 30% happens. We do have it nice, neat, no averaging needed here because 30% happens when Z is 0.84.